stop with my explanations right there. You say, why? Well, in the first service, I said he was visiting their grandson, and then about halfway through the service, I recognized that Karen Cassidy, his wife, was sitting here in the audience, and everyone was like praying for her because they felt bad. And Okay, so if you see Karen, there is no problem. She said if he was visiting the grandchild, then there would be a problem. Okay, so <laughs> that's not happening. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I have no idea where he is. He's just not here. How about that? All right. These gentlemen have Bibles. This morning, we are going to look intently at a passage of Scripture. And so if you don't normally look at a Bible, follow along. I encourage you to do that this morning. Um, so borrow one of these. Uh, if you don't have one of your own, you can keep it. But we're going to look at one passage of Scripture, and we're going to look at a lot of it. So it may be easier for you to follow along with us. Question is, what's it going to take? You ever heard that? What's it going to take? Maybe it's a talk show host saying, what's it going to take for America to realize we're in trouble? Maybe it's a pastor saying, what's it going to take for the church to wake up? Maybe it's a child or grandchild of yours where you're saying, what's it going to take for God to get their attention? Our ministry is Good News Joan Prison Ministry. We work with inmates. Our goal is to share the gospel with 10 million inmates around the world. Um, it's a lot of people. Mike Culliver is a guy I met a couple years ago, and Mike had been in and out of jail for the better part of 20 years. Now, if you are like me, you're probably a NORP. You didn't know you were a NORP, did you? Uh, what's a NORP? Uh, normal, ordinary, responsible person. Okay. You're like, okay, I feel better. Um, you know, we pay our taxes, pay our bills when we can, um, change our oil, uh, follow the speed limit most of the time. Right, that's a NORP. And a NORP, see, if a NORP goes to jail, the NORP gets the message real quick. We see it, okay, I'm not going back. If I had ever been incarcerated uh, for an offense, I've been in and out of jail 10 or 12 times this year, but it wasn't um, an offense issue. Uh, <laughs> but if you, if you go to jail for an offense and you're a NORP, you get the picture real quick. And you vow, you know what, I'm not going back there. Right? That's how NORPs think. And that's how it would work for us. But that didn't work for Mike. Uh, but as much as Mike's arrest record is remarkable, he has another record that's even more astounding. You see, Mike, when he was 12 years old, he vowed that he never used drugs. And at age 13, one year later, he was offered, go to church or get high. He chose the latter. And his life was a tailspin after that. He did drugs in hotel rooms, hospitals, halfway houses, and in prison. Lowest point, he says, is when he mixed rainwater from a pothole with drugs and injected himself. That's pretty low. Mike it, uh, checked himself into 28 drug and alcohol rehab programs. 28. And none of them worked. Then finally was facing another jail term, faced down a jailhouse floor, and he gave up and let God control his life. After serving that term, Mike was released. He graduated from a program in Kentucky we call the Life Change Program. And today he's serving the Lord. He's even an instructor in that program. So God has restored him to his family. He's been clean and sober for many years. And now, most importantly, he's restored to God. But it's amazing what it took to get his attention and what God did to get his attention. We serve a sovereign God. And when I say sovereign God, two things jump out at me. The first thing is that God can do what he wants. He created us, he set it all in motion, he can do as he pleases. He has the power and the authority to do so. But the second thing that strikes me is that God knows what he's doing. So there's comfort in that, that you have a God who can do as he pleases, but he knows what he's doing, and what he's doing in each of our lives is he's bringing the circumstances of life together to draw us to the point where we would be willing to submit to him, commit to him, and follow him. That's the whole story. So this morning, I want to take a look at a passage in Scripture. I want to look at a famous king, probably the most famous king in Scripture other than Saul, David, and Solomon. Those are the famous kings, first kings of Israel. We're not talking about them. We're going to talk about King Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe you've heard of him. So the book of Daniel, if you want to turn there, is where we're going to go. And it's interesting to me that Besides those three kings of Israel, there's more of the biblical text devoted to Nebuchadnezzar's story than any other king. Forty other kings of Israel and Judah, and yet God spends the better part of half of the book of Daniel 
telling us about King Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel chapter 1, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. He's the last of the major prophets. Little trivia question, why are they called the major prophets instead of the minor prophets? Because they're longer, right? That's all. Not because they're more important, it is a longer, right? So we have five major prophets. Daniel is the last of them. So we're introduced to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 1, verse 1, and here we go. We read, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. King of Judah, the... uh, nation of Israel has been divided after Solomon's reign into two groups. There's ten northern tribes referred to in Scripture, continue to be called Israel. The southern two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, go by the name of Judah. Jehoiakim is their king. And what's interesting to me is that a sovereign God gives Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. So who's Nebuchadnezzar? Well, history says that Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest of the Babylonian Rulers, And he ruled for about 40 years, beginning around 605 B.C. 586 B.C., he conquers Judah. And secular history says that he was a brutal, powerful, ambitious king. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a second. But he's a pagan. He's an idol worshiper. He's got a lot of gods in his universe And some have suggested that his name, Nebuchadnezzar, actually means favorite among the gods. So he's a humble guy, right? (laughs) Thinks of himself uh, quite well. But it's interesting to me that a sovereign God gives his chosen people into the hands of a pagan king. So we're going to take a look at three scenes in this book of Daniel. Three encounters that Nebuchadnezzar has with God, and let's look at his reaction. The first scene, chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to all the magicians, the astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king said to them, I've had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. The Chaldeans spoke to him in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell us your dream and we'll interpret it for you. Verse 5, then the king answered and said, my decision is firm. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be, watch, nice guy, cut to pieces and your house shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Very nice guy, isn't he? Tell me the dream. The problem is I've forgotten the dream, so you need to tell me what I've forgotten, and then please tell me what it means. Needless to say, they are unable. The punishment, since they can, is they're going to be cut to pieces, and their houses will be made in ash heap. Positive reinforcement. Love that. Verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answers Arioch, captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Arioch tells him the story. Verse 16, so Daniel went in, asked the king to give him time so that he might tell the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house, made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Those guys are the guys who become Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a minute. That they might seek mercy from God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Verse 25. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found the man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. I found that interesting. I found him. I don't believe that he did. I believe Daniel had gone to see the king himself. Verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king. He said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Verse 31, you, O king, you were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you. Its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone 
that was cut without hands, struck the image on its feet, broke them to pieces. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all crushed, became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And the interpretation Daniel explains, you king, you're the, you're the gold. You're at the top. This is your kingdom, but it's going to be replaced by another, and another, and another, and another, and they're gradually going to get weaker. Notice the value of the metal. It's going to get weaker and weaker, and so on, and then all of these kingdoms will be done away with. They'll be destroyed, totally gone. So Nebuchadnezzar listens in his response, verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, commanded that they should present an offering, an incense to Daniel. And the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is a God of gods, Lord of kings, secret, revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Notice that. Your God is a God of gods. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar is saying? Wow, that's a pretty cool trick you just did there. If your God did that, he's pretty neat. Matter of fact, he might be better than some of the ones I've got. That's a pretty cool God. So Nebuchadnezzar has his first encounter with the power of God, and that's his response. I don't think he's gotten the message yet. So the next scene, chapter 3, verse 1. Turn there. Notice in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, its width 6 cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Kind of struck me as ironic. He just had a dream about an image that had been destroyed, and then he goes out and does what? Builds himself one. So he puts up a statue of himself. It's kind of like, that was a cool party trick there, Daniel but I'm going to make one for myself. So he heard the message, but he didn't listen. Verse 2, King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather the satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which the king had set up. So they all came. Verse 4, then a herald cried out, to you it's commanded peoples, nations, and languages. At the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music you shall fall down, Worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So you know this story. It's the fiery furnace story. Been to Sunday school, you've heard it. So Nebuchadnezzar calls everybody who is somebody and says, Hey, I've set up a statue to myself. It's 90 feet tall. I want you to come and I want you to worship it at the dedication. But verse 12, there's some that aren't listening. So the Chaldeans come, and they say, King, there's some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And these men, O king, they've not paid due regard to you. They don't serve your gods. They don't worship your gold image. Nebuchadnezzar becomes enraged, verse 13. And he gave the command, bring them here, verse 14. And he spoke and said, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? You do not serve my gods. You do not worship the gold image I've set up. Now, if you're ready at the time to hear the sound and the music, and you fall down and worship the image that I've made, then great. But if you don't worship, you're going to be cast immediately in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in the matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, we will not worship the gold image which you've set up. Now, for some reason in the Sunday school version, they got a second chance. I seem to recall that, that he said, and he did it again, and then they were thrown in. But the text doesn't say that. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar says, fine, if that's your attitude, in you go. So he heats up the furnace. They go and throw him in. The guards who are throwing them in die from the heat. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and sees they threw in three. Now there's a fourth. And he says it appears to be the Son of God. That's his second encounter. His reaction, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who sent his angel delivered his servants who trusted in him. They have frustrated the king's word, yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything bad or anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, 
and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there's no other God who can deliver like this. That seems to be the only punishment available, right? <laughs> We're going to cut them up and burn them up. That's all there is, right? So it's like he's saying, hey, I kind of like this God of theirs. He does some pretty cool stuff. I've never actually seen anybody pull anybody out of fire like that. So let's do this for him. Nobody say anything bad about him. How's that? We'll make that deal with him just in case he's real. We'll just make a deal that says nobody say anything bad. Has he gotten the message yet? I don't think so. No. Now, between chapters 3 and chapter 4, we have probably about a 30-year lag, give or take. Maybe not quite. But it's a long time. Chapter 4, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar makes an interesting declaration. And he says, verse 1, To all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. And how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, his dominion is from generation to generation. I thought it was good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me, he says. As if he's letting them know, hey, me and this God of theirs, we're pretty good friends. We're pretty tight. So I'm not sure if this is a declaration about God or a declaration about Nebuchadnezzar. 30 years later, doesn't seem he's still got the message. So we go to verse 4. And beginning in verse 4, we have a di uh, almost a monologue of Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel's writing this, but it's spoken in the first person, Nebuchadnezzar sharing what I believe now is his personal testimony. I, Nebuchadnezzar, at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts of my bed, the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon that they might know Make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, the astrologers, Chaldeans, the soothsayers, here they come again. I told them the dream this time. That was nice of them. But they didn't make known its interpretation. But Daniel came to me at last. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the, holy spirit, the spirit of the holy God is in you, no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen in its interpretation. Now, we could read the whole dream. That might take too long, so let me sum up. There's a tree, a glorious tree, fruitful tree. And a holy one appears, and he says, chop it down, cut off its branches. Verse 16, the holy one says, then let his heart, the heart of the king, be changed from that of a man... Let him to be given to the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. What's the purpose of this? Verse 17. This is a decision by decree of the watchers, the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets it over the lowest of them. So that's the dream. Daniel then gives the interpretation. He says, King, you're the tree. God said, going to chop you down. And not only that, you're going to go nuts. Verse 25, here's what's going to happen to you, king. They're going to drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be like the beasts of the field. They'll make you like, they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, meaning you're going to be outdoors. Seven times shall pass over you till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. See the second time? Till you know the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he chooses. That's a sovereign God. Verse 27, Daniel gives him a warning. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins, be righteous, and your, break off your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there will be a lengthening of your prosperity. So the warning is pretty clear. Here's what's going to happen, king. You're going to get chopped down. You're going to go insane. And Daniel warns him and says, look, I think if you repent and turn from your sin, there might be something for you. But he didn't listen. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, walking by the royal palace of Babylon, the king spoke and said, is not the great Babylon that I've built for myself, a royal dwelling by my mighty power, the honor for myself? And while the word, verse 31, was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be the beast of the field. They'll make you eat grass. Seven times shall pass. 
until, here it is a third time, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Third time. Verse 33, that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, driven from men, ate grass, body was wet with dew, his hair had grown like feathers, his nails like bird's claws. So how does this end? Verse 34. At the end of the time, at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My understanding returned to me. I blessed the Most High, praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, he'd said basically that before. His last encounter with God, Nebuchadnezzar had said, okay, God, your dominion reigns forever. Your kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 37, here's where it turns. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. I think he finally got the message. Won't know until we get to heaven, but I think Nebuchadnezzar at this point becomes a believer. Don't know for sure. But he finally acknowledged God, and he acknowledged his place with respect to God. I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, his ways are justice. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. That's what a sovereign God does. He moves in nations. He moves in people. He brings them to the point of where he wants them. No individual, no pagan king, who God chose, by the way. God chose a pagan king to use for his purpose. None of them are beyond his power or beyond his reach. So you may be thinking, well, John, that's very nice. Thank you for reading four chapters of Daniel to us this morning. (laughs) We did skip some parts, by the way, so you might want to go back and fill in the blanks there. But what exactly is the point? Well, thanks for asking. There's two groups of people in the world. There's just two, two groups of people in America, two groups of people in this church. And it's not Democrats and Republicans. It's not Libertarians and Tea Party. It's not conservatives and liberals. In Matthew 25, at the judgment, God says he's going to divide the people, sheep and goats is what he calls them. And the sheep are those who know the name of Christ, who have followed Christ, who have put their faith and trust in Christ. And they will spend eternity with God. And everybody else won't. Everybody else will suffer the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death. That's where we found Nebuchadnezzar. He was on the goat side. Did he make it to the sheep side? I'm not sure. I think he may have. But he was pretty impressed with his own performance. But God was tracking him down. God was revealing himself on an ongoing basis. And ultimately, God had to drive him insane to get his attention before he finally listened. In the first scene, Nebuchadnezzar was willing to acknowledge God, but he wasn't willing to submit to him. At the fiery furnace, he was willing to praise God, but he did not commit to him. Finally, at the end, after his brush with insanity, I think he finally gave in. Because he said, I honor, I praise, and extol God. And then he goes on to say, it's God who's here, and I'm here. How many chances would Nebuchadnezzar have gotten? I have no idea. How many chances will he give you? I have no idea. But it seems to me that there'd be no better day than today to respond to what God has been doing in your life. You're not here by accident. A sovereign God brought you here. And his challenge to you is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, you're not off the hook. Because God continues to pound away at us. Now, Buddy and I have an analogy that we use. Some people 
all it takes is a little swat and you get the, your attention. Some of you, it takes a two by four across the head to get your attention. Some of us, it's more like a telephone pole that we have to hit to get our attention. But God's drawing us to himself because he wants to use us. He kept drawing Nebuchadnezzar to the point where he would acknowledge the true and living God. He wants us to be obedient. Is it a selfishness thing? Is it an anger thing? Is it another sin problem? What's God been probing at you and what's it going to take to get your attention? Shenaniah Woodall, there's a name for you, guy I met in Colorado. Shenaniah grew up in a Christian home, age 15. He left home, joined a gang, got involved in drugs, violence, all sorts of things, found himself in prison. After a couple years in prison and several trips to prison, he finally gave his life to Christ and said, you know, Lord, I'm going to give up. Amazing set of circumstances. But Shenaniah was facing another charge with a potential 20-year sentence. And Shen and I was pretty convinced that he was going to get a get-out-of-jail-free card, right? He'd put his trust in Christ, and he was pretty sure, look, Lord's going to let me go. He's going to let me walk out of here. It didn't happen. He did receive another five-year sentence, and he was not happy. Mad, angry, I think were the words that he used. He said, I was ticked. He said, but looking back, I recognize now that there were a lot of things in me that still needed to change. If that isn't a description of discipleship, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of things in us that still need to change. He had five years in prison to help him sort it out. What's God got to do in your life for you to listen, for you to trust him, for you to obey? Election day is near, and nobody's happy. That make y'all nervous, like, oh my gosh, where is he going with this one? <laughs> there's no signs, you know? Normally there's signs up. I've made it a habit, at least eight years ago, I put signs in my mother-in-law's yard. <laughs> just for kicks. I, even, I put two candidates in her front yard. That really upset her. I don't think she ever figured out it was me. I told her it was my brother-in-law. Um, <laughs> People don't even like the people they're voting for, right? It's like even if you know who you're voting for, you don't even like them. So I was reading an article this week, came out a couple weeks ago by Max Licato, Christian author. Maybe you've seen it. Let me quote from him. We'll close with this. Max Licato says, I have a prediction. He says, I know exactly what November 9th will bring. That's the day after the election, by the way. Another day of God's perfect sovereignty. He will still be in charge. His throne will still be occupied. He will still manage the affairs of the world. Never before has his providence depended on a king, a president, or a ruler. And it won't on November 9th either. The Lord can control a king's mind as he controls a river. He can direct it as he pleases, Proverbs 21. Nebuchadnezzar, continuing the quote, was considered to be the mightiest king of his generation, but God humbled and put him in detention for seven years. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-eight: 28, the kingdom is the Lord's and he, the Lord, rules over the nations. Continuing, understanding God's sovereignty over the nations opens the door to peace. When we realize that God influences the hearts of all rulers, we can then choose to pray for them rather than fret about them. Rather than wring our hands, we bend our knees, we select prayer over despair. Had a revelation to myself this morning, or actually this week. I don't think I've ever prayed for, that our current president would be saved. I've prayed he'd be wise. I'd pray that he'd listen to God. But I don't think I ever prayed for his salvation. Shame on me. Trusting God with our nation seems about all we can do. But trusting God with our lives, that seems like that's totally up to you, isn't it? Let's pray.
Father Nebuchadnezzar demonstrates that you rule in the affairs of man and you use whomever you choose. They don't even have to be followers of you for you to do what only you can do and only what you will do. The logic of that makes no sense to us. And in that we rejoice because we have to trust you. So, Father, on our nation, we commit all of this to you, trusting you for the outcome that we know you're going to use some way, somehow, to accomplish your purpose. But that purpose, Lord, tends to start in our own hearts and lives. You're calling us to obedience. You're calling us to repentance. And we trust, Lord, that you will be at work challenging us to seek you, to follow you. And we pray that it won't take a whole lot more for us to pay attention and to listen. For it's in your name we ask and pray. Amen. Prayer and care team is up front. I hate to see them lonely. But they're here. If today's the day that you'd like to meet Jesus Christ for the first time, they'd love to introduce you to him. And if you just need prayer and encouragement, they'd love to meet you up here as well. Thank you, and God bless.